गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी प्रोफेसर पांडे वाइस चांसलर ऑफ जे एन यू एम एस गेला प्रोफेसर सुब्रमण्यम स्वामी एंड नॉट पॉलिटिशियन स्वामी प्रोफेसर कुमार स्वामी एंड मिस डेंगरा फ्रॉम राउटलेज at the outset i must thank my dear friend kumar for according me this opportunity because over the last few years there was a sense that perhaps i had crossed my sell by date for a variety of reasons so when kumar suggested that i should come this afternoon my first question was that response was that listen covid has made me very insular and i'm not stepping out so i'd prefer to sort of uh, be in the audience but those of you who know kumar swami you know he doesn't take no for an answer so therefore i'm very glad to be here this evening and share what i would call as not only my thoughts on the book which is the focus of our attention but also i think on a much wider range of subjects and issues that have been raised both by the vice chancellor professor pandit and my dear senior esteemed colleague of yester year on television debate subramaniam swami garu i must introduce a little bit of telugu here because there's too much tamil chauvinism going on <laughs> so <laughs> professor is a telugu way and you know you if you remember your brother and i used to spar about this for many years when we were colleagues but uh, the levity apart as i said professor swami and i have met in the past and i have always uh, valued his inputs even if i have not agreed with his point of view but he has taken disagreement i would say in a very academic and objective manner and i respect him for that i do not know the israeli ambassador excellency gilon we are just meeting but i knew many of his predecessors over the years particularly when india and israel had established the equivalent of formal relations the reason really was that at that time i was in the idsa and i'm very glad to see many of my former colleagues from the idsa here and senior faculty members of jnu who at that time contributed in no small measure to the activities of the idsa but my own reason for getting involved in matters pertaining to israel was that at that time the idsa the president of the idsa was the venerable shri p v narasimha rao the prime minister of india who concurrently was also the president of idsa and many of you are aware of the politics and the history of that period and i was frankly uh, just the equivalent of a note taker in some of the deliberations not all and therefore we had our own senior elders at that time in our community of think tankers the most redoubtable of course was the late shri k subramanian who when i joined the idsa had already become the former director and my immediate boss was a commodore just jit singh who many of you may have known or read or whatever so they too were the elders and so there was a whole set of activities that we were doing with israel some were above the radar some were below the radar and that's how excellency i had a chance to meet some of your colleagues and other members from your headquarters and therefore for me israel does have what i would call as a special resonance and therefore when i saw the book by the way i have read the book so i think that would allow me to make a few comments depending on the time in a more informed way but before i get to the book i thought i might spend a couple of minutes and kumar you'll be the time keeper and tell me when i should finish in as much as i used to tell you to finish when we were an idsa so give me a 2 minute alert because i tend to ramble otherwise but let me sort of uh, spend a couple of minutes on professor kumar swami whom we knew as kumar he had a long name so he encouraged us to call him kumar when we first met he was then a young student at jnu and now that professor pandit does remind me about that phase of my life we were situated in sapru house i don't know how many of the younger generation even know of a place called sapru house but that at tam at one time was the center of activity intellectual activity as far as delhi was concerned and the lawns of sapru house and there was just one in number canteen which served you lukewarm tea <laughs> extra sweet in chipped cups and no saucers but i can assure you that the lawns of sapru house when the weather was conducive 
were home to some of the most stimulating and intense debates on a range of issues and not just amongst the Indian academic and think tank community but even those who were working on India from outside external academics and think tankers and I remember my not friend but a senior colleague whom I used to know over the years was Stephen Cohen the professor from the United States who was one of their India hands and he used to say in lighter vein that coming to Sapru house and meeting Subbu was like being thrown into the lion's den particularly for an American scholar working on the nuclear issue and Pakistan and so on and he said my only savior was when the canteen boy would come with the kettle and six cups and serve the tea and then there'd be a break in the so that was the kind of I would say ambiance that I first met Kumar as a young student from JNU and I think perhaps Professor Pandit was also a student and they would come to Sapru house and <laughs> visit the library and things of that sort but the reason I'm focusing on Kumar is that in those days we had conferences that the IDSA would plan international conferences national conferences because we were the only show in town the ORF had not yet been born so that was the reason why the VIF and the ORF which now dominate the think tank space were not there the IDSA was the only show and the only other side of competitor that we had was the ICWA one was run by the MEA and the other was by the MOD and so therefore you know you can see the intense quote unquote healthy competition <laughs> between two think tanks so when we did these conferences we had to invite external HR for subjects that IDSA did not have in-house expertise and I remember one conversation where Kumar came into focus and we had a list of usual suspects from JNU which is that if the subject was China both Subhu and Jasheet would tell me and by the way there were no cell phones in those days and JNU's landlines never worked <laughs> I don't know the current situation so we would identify and Subhu or Jasheet would tell me Acha, who are you calling from JNU so the joke right away was usual suspects China GPD for the younger scholars who don't know GPD it, stood, it stands for Professor GP Deshpande a famous you know well known academic in his time on China so we take off GPD next would be the perennial you know subject for discussions in India on any security matter following China is Pakistan who will come from Pakistan again usual suspect alas no more with us Kalim Bahadur so today Professor Bahadur so the next subject as you know in the Indian lexicon the region that we would be focusing on would be West Asia now I will not go into names but there were some usual suspects at one of those events I think it was uh, Mr. K. Subramanian when he was going he said uh, Bhaskar do you know this fellow Kumar Swami uh, he said I know of him but I he said no no I think this conference put his name down so that was my first kind of shall we say focus saying that let me get to know Kumar a little better apparently Subo had heard Kumar speaking in one of our either weekly events or I forget exactly what but the long and short is that Mr. Subramanian made a recommendation saying that if you don't get the usual suspects please look at this young scholar and that's how Kumar Swami came into focus for us in the IDSA and then a lot of things followed I was the deputy director and I would have a lot of the younger scholars from the JNU particularly who were part of IDSA's research team and I was the first filter for them in terms of their written work and I think some of them sitting here may recall that I was not an easy filter <laughs> and there'd be lots of angst because I would return certain manuscripts for rewriting and I remember one ex JNU scholar was very angry and even made a representation saying how can a naval officer reject my manuscript I'm a PhD from JNU etc etc but why I'm saying all this is that there were a few people who submitted very cogent well-written manuscripts whether it was a short article a long article journal article whatever conference submission and that's when I first noticed what I would call as professor now professor then Dr. Kumar Swami he just finished his PhD and joined us that he brought a lot of diligence brought a lot of rigor to his work and he was already at that time acknowledged as somebody who was focusing on Israel in a very hands-on manner and from then onwards as I said he became a very valued member of the IDSA for a short duration as a research scholar there and very soon after he moved to the JNU 
and from then onwards of course he's had a very i would say impressive and commendable trajectory in terms of his own scholarship and over the years i've lost track but i think kumar has personally supervised along with professor pandit and the rest of the team a large number of phd's and mphil theses kumar have you touched 50 or i'm not sure but anyway i shouldn't embarrass you but i know because of my association with kumar swami and the west asia cluster i know many of the younger scholars i can say this with a fair amount of conviction because i have read many of their i would say original manuscripts when they used to come for publication whether it is an idsa or elsewhere that in his own manner as part of the west asia faculty in uh, jnu professor kumar swami has irrigated the domain in a very very i would say positive manner and i think that would be a significant contribution i am sure jnu as professor pandit has reminded us has many illustrious members in its faculty both retired and those who are serving and i think the book here that we are now releasing or has been released is in many ways a testimony i think to that scholarship and i'd like to commend you kumar i think this would be a useful document for those who follow in the teaching of west asia and israel in particular i'm not sure when kumar is retiring but there will be a west asia after kumar swami once he retires and i think this particular book would be a very valuable uh, input for those who are going to follow him as teachers now i think so much for embarrassing kumar swami in public and talking about his book let me make a few comments about the book itself kumar i have a few minutes if i do i'd like to spend a few minutes on the book this is a very good book by the way i mean there are few areas where i don't perhaps you know may have some observations which may be critical but i have always been described as a jaundiced critic whenever i do book reviews because i read books carefully and i find observations that i try to bring into the public domain but i'll say at the outset that this is a good book in the context in which it was meant to be uh, in, in in which it was written to provide number one a very cogent account of what has been described as the arab israeli conflict and notwithstanding what the ambassador has said and what mr swami has said about the provenance and the genealogy of the conflict itself and the fact that there may be a more positive kind of perhaps dinoma and that there is a reality that the palestine issue has fallen off the map and that the arab israeli conflict is slowly going on to the back burner notwithstanding those observations i think the region west asia as we call it and the fault lines that still in a way punctuate that entire region will be there for a long time and that would be of interest i think to a community like jnu where we have academic scholars who are studying not only this particular region but the entire lattice of asia and all the conflicts i think which one way or the other will find some kind of a correspondence either directly or by osmosis with what was generically referred to as the arab israeli conflict now on this book as i said there are many chapters but i thought i'd pick up a couple of observations which i saw which are specific to india the whole history is there the entire sort of un resolutions how it was sort of framed all that kumar swami has put across very very painstakingly but towards the end of the book you know he makes reference to the external players and their role in the arab israeli conflict as he has described it and in one section towards the very end he draws attention to the complexity of the problem the way in which india had very carefully studied what should be its own approach and there is a whole history of the indian position which goes back to india after independence and what you might call as the nehruvian period when there was a certain approach as far as the region was concerned as far as the palestinian issue itself is concerned and again the book gives you a lot of background about the gandhian view which goes back to pre 47 you know which again i think mahatma gandhi and his own views on all these issues khilafat palestine arabs etc etc but in that particular section and i am specifically looking at page 264 
professor kumar swami talks about the current options as far as india is concerned and there's one phrase which i believe amongst the academics amongst the think tankers and perhaps amongst our diplomats who have served in the region even well before the end of the cold war i know what i would call as some of the more uh, relevant structural strands that may not be in public memory today and the specific kind of binary that professor kumara swami alludes to this is only a passing reference he talks about the current period and india having to perhaps or not india all the external players having to weigh the options between hard nosed realism and questionable moral arguments this drew my attention you know i marked it in the book when i was reading it and as all of you are aware this is shorthand for much that has preceded in terms of how india has looked at the region how india has tried to frame its own policies as far as the entire west asian region is concerned and the specific bilaterals of which israel is the most recent i would say formal entrant which is after the end of the cold war when india recognizes and formalizes its relationship with israel and i think this is the kind of uh, vein that needs to be mined by the current generation of scholars for whatever i would say are the ways in which the national interest or the larger collective interest is framed and that's where i believe that this is a book that would serve a larger purpose <laughs> now this brings me to a larger issue which is not just india and israel but the region itself and here i am encouraged by professor pandit's remarks that jnu has always been what she has described as the seven d's and i have been a witness i was never a student of jnu but i have engaged with jnu for a variety of reasons largely because of my idsa association and i think dialogue debate intense debate and the fact that this diversity of views could be accommodated within the campus is something which needs to be valued acknowledged nurtured kept alive and i'd like to commend the vice chancellor for enabling this and why i'm flagging this in relation to the book and the region is that many years ago i remember i attended a lecture that was delivered by professor chomsky now many of you have read heard of professor chomsky and his own views not only on american foreign policy but what he felt was the culpability of the united states and its many transgressions in different parts of the world west asia was one of them it was very close to his heart he himself is of jewish origin and i think we are aware that he represents one school of jewish intellectuals in american public life who have kept debate alive who have kept dialogue alive in a very rigorous and in a very informed way i will not belabor the point of uh, what professor chomsky said on that particular day but i was lucky in the sense that he was willing to spend some time with a few of us and i do know that i tried very hard to get him to speak on all india radio i used to be a fairly regular contributor in those days to spotlight but he was unable to but he made some observations which were very relevant at that time and i believe that as young students you all might like to revisit some of these debates which this book may provide the trigger and it's in that sense that i would say that the spirit of scholarship and the kind of academic and objective study that is required is something that i think both professor kumar swami and his colleagues have demonstrated in ample measure and i'd like to commend both the author and also the publisher for doing a very good book in terms of i always i'm very grateful when publishers use a font size that people like me can read so i'd like to thank routledge on that note and once again kumar i'm not sure if i read your signs right but i think my time is up so i'd like to thank you again and commend you for this book thank you, thank you.